Друзья, дорогие, я, uh, меня попросили uh, представить нашу лекцию, нашу сегодняшнюю мероприятие. Не бойтесь, я буду говорить не мой turn to talk. If I were talking, there will be two, twice more time. Uh, to be serious, in the announcement on the website, today it was not mentioned that this is not just another lecture, but the result of cooperation between Moscow Art Magazine that is supported by Garage very liberally and its publishing is enabled by Garage. And this presentation, this lecture would be the presentation of the freshest issue of the Moscow Art Magazine, and David is one of the contributors to this issue. It is the third event in this series, the program has run since the beginning of this year, and each new issue is presented with a lecture by one of the contributors to the issue. We have had two events, and both of them were really interesting and colorful, with legendary and luminary figures. And this time we are happy to welcome David Joslett, who is a contributor to this present issue. However, I hope and I believe that you already know David, not just through his original English works, but also through translations of his works. If you go to our website and enter the issue archive, you will find two more materials by David, both really interesting, both really provocative and refined, and if you know David's work, then this lecture and this article would be a surprise for you, because Usually, David is concerned with the most radical, the most innovative practices in contemporary art. He has done brilliant analysis of neo-post-conceptual practices, of performative practices in art, and suddenly he turned his attention to painting. And he has given a radical reinterpretation of contemporary painting, uh, going from the practices of contemporary artists and discovered its deep conceptual resource. And I think that in today's lecture he will elaborate more on this key to understanding painting. And in this short interview that we are going to publish on our website, this video interview that we recorded in this room, I asked David whether it's possible now to look at painting retrospectively in this post-conceptual perspective of analysis of new painting, can we use this perspective for the history of painting in general? And this discovery of new art, does it become a new key to understanding the whole tradition. Can modernity and contemporaneity be retrospective? I think you will see his answer on our website. So now I'm not going to dwell long on his biography because you may easily found it, find it on Wikipedia, on your phone, or on the website of the garage. And the last from me is my gratitude to Anna Mikhailenko, who is a great organizer of all such events that we arrange together with Garage. And I'd like to thank Marina, who is her assistant today. And now have a nice evening with one of the most brilliant New York art criticists and interpreters, interpreters of contemporary art and the editor of the legendary magazine October in 1993, when we created our magazine, we looked at their experience and used their experience. They, their magazine is named after 
the famous film by Eisenstein. So the dialogue with David is also a dialogue with his magazine that has played a greater role in creating our Moscow art magazine. Thank you very much, uh, Victor, for, for your introduction and for the invitation to be here. It's great to be at the garage, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about how painting can um, intersect with and begin to mold history in new ways. A mark in paint registers the passage of force through matter. Such trajectories are distinct from the labor of mimetic representation. As Cy Twombly has said, quote, each line is inhabited by its own history. It does not explain, it is, not, it is the event of its own materialization. And here I'm showing you um, a work by Twombly called Lita and the Swan, which has a mythological um, illusion that I'll be talking more about in a moment. So I want to put pressure on this very brief statement of Twombly. On an initial reading, his use of the word history um, in the statement when he says, each line is inhabited by its own history seems both self-evident and banal, right? Especially when read against his second phrase, which stipulates that a line is, quote, the event of its own materialization. So we could say that the history he's talking about is the history of making and nothing more. In short, the history of the line is the history of its appearance, the event of its materialization. But I want to put a little more pressure on the seemingly innocent term history by introducing two other dimensions of the word that are relevant to his painting, as well as to a much broader range of painting practices, both contemporary and historical. The first is an allusion both to the history of painting, the history of art that focuses on painting, and the long um, legacy of different moves that have been made within that history. And the second is the genre known as history painting, that genre that was dominant from um, after the Renaissance through most of the 19th century, when it was the most prestigious form of painting in Europe. And it required choosing idealized ancient, mythical, or religious stories to dramatize and paint. So I'm interested in thinking about the history of materialization in terms of different kinds of history, including um, the history of history painting itself. Now, Twombly explicitly takes on the tradition of history painting, entitling the work we've been considering Lita and the Swan, as I mentioned a moment ago, which was pr precisely the kind of mythological title that was appropriate, or a mythological content or tale that was appropriate to history painting itself. And just to give you, you know, the most um, abbreviated um, genealogy of such painting, um, I'm showing you on the left a work by uh, Rubens on the subject, Lita and the Swan, and on the right, um, a work by uh, Paul Cezanne. So from the moment of, let's say, the flowering of um, in the 15th and 16th uh, and 17th, uh, sorry, 16th and 17th centuries of um, European painting to the moment of its uh, initial breakdown uh, into a modernist idiom in Cezanne, this idiom, this story, this myth of Lita and the Swan continues. We could say on one account, um, we, uh, we can see one account of this tradition in the label that was written by the Museum of Modern Art, which owns this work by Twombly. Um, and I'm just going to quote the label to give a sense of how this idea of a kind of um, mythological history painting is carried into a realm of abstraction here. So MoMA's label says, Rome, Twombly's home since the 1950s, 
has nurtured his fascination with classical antiquity. In this work, he refers to the Roman myth in which Jupiter, Lord of the Gods, takes the shape of a swan in order to ravish Leda, the beautiful mother of Helen, Helen of Troy, over whom the Trojan War would be fought. Twombly's version of this old art historical theme, I'm still quoting, supplies no contrast of features and flesh, but a fusion of violent energies in furiously thrashing overlays of crayon, pencil, and ruddy paint. A few recognized signs, hearts, a phallus, fly out from this explosion in stark contrast to the sober window-like rectangle near the top of the painting. And you can see some of these um, anatomical elements um, in the painting that the label describes. So in this reading of going from a mythological story of Leda and the Swan to an abstraction as you see here, there's a transposition from the medic function of form, form being something that um, represents, to um, a propulsive or energetic notion of form. So for instance, instead of a rape scene between Leda and the Swan, um, MoMA's uh, label describes furious, furiously thrashing overlays of crayon, pencil, and ruddy paint. In other words, the rape here is one that occurs through um, the action of the medium itself. But what if, in addition to transforming characters or characteristics into marks, Twombly wanted to both carry into the 1960s the history of painting as a long um, European tradition and also the value of history painting as a genre dedicated to representing those noble subjects? Through this allusion both to history painting and the history of painting, Twombly marks the passage of time through his cont continuation of a tradition or his belatedness within it. In other words, despite seeming to occupy a position of a modernist painter who has left the tradition of European painting behind, he's distinctively and explicitly owning that tradition through taking one of its um, most uh, storied motifs. In other words, the event that is the materialization of the line is indeed suffused with history, a kind of history that is not limited to the time it takes to make a mark on canvas. Each mark is equally a passage of medium on a support, a physical um, notion of time, uh, actual duration of making, and a complex performance of the passage of time and an activation of the long history of painting. So I guess what I really want to think about is how painting can become an account of or a model for history in a multi-level way. The slide that I'm showing you now looks like an abbreviated canonical history of Western painting leading to modern art, from the revived figural naturalism explored in the 17th century to the distortion of such mimeticism in Cezanne on the way to complete abstraction. But if such an evolutionary genealogy were correct, why would Twombly retain the notion of Leda and the Swan at all? Is it simply, as MoMA's label implies, because he lived in Rome and was smitten by um, the classical uh, world around him? or the remains of that classical world. I want to suggest instead that painting's triple articulation of timing, first, the time involved in discharging a mark, the time of making, second, the way that each painting enters into a dialogue with painting's long history, its sort of um, intertextual uh, appearance or temporality, and finally, the registration in painting of a passage from one figure to another, in Twombly's work, for instance, from a pencil line to a phallic thrust of the god Jupiter, in other words, a migration from object, mark, to subject, god, um, in the guise of a, uh, um, or the same kind of transformation in the guise of a swan, that this represents a kind of politics that is engaged with history, 
and how it is recounted as opposed to the more current notions of critique and subversion. So what I want to argue throughout this lecture is that what painting can do as a progressive practice is to remake our understanding of history, to make history spatial in certain ways. Let me say more about how formal passage, the passage of paint on medium, embraces history by turning to one of the touchstones of um, avant-garde mar modernism, Marcel Duchamp. In this work, which is titled The Passage from Virgin to Bride or Le Passage de la Vierge de la Marie, is an allegory of an event where each line is inhabited by its own history, in Twombly's words. Each line is itself an embodiment of history. The passage claims to enact the transformation of a virgin into a bride, a transaction by which a form of sexuality transform or exchange between men of a woman transforms a pure subject, a virgin, into um, a kind of commodity, a bride, which is exchanged in a kind of ethnographic um, instantiation of culture. But Duchamp's painting represents neither virgin nor bride mimetically, nor does its pocked visceral surface achieve any transformation from one kind of object to another. While spidery stem forms may dilate into broader bulbs or facets of color, their composition fails to resolve into a stable object. In other words, this painting is a continuous form of passage. It does not end up as one thing or another. <coughs> its event has no end point or consummation. I like to think of it as a kind of continuous organic infrastructure out of which any number of effects might emerge. It's diagrammatic in a sense. In other words, it consists of pure relationality without beginning or end. In other words, it's a passage, a duration through time. Um, it's the indication, the designation of a transformation without the consummation or, um, or achievement of that transformation. In other words, we could say that this painting invokes an event, one that we might even call historical, a marriage, which is, after all, the building block of history through its status as a vehicle of successive generations. You can think of marriage again and Anthropologists have done this as the kind of um, establishment of culture through the exchange um, of women in marriage. A marriage is a kind of building block of history through its status of, um, of a generational model or unity. But the two endpoints named here, virginity and marriage, as I mentioned before, are not achieved. The painting itself stabilizes the intermediate space between them. It is a space of time without resolution. It thus enacts the passage of an historical event that has not yet and never will be consummated. But it is also the suspension of the designation of form as either subject or object. This painting is neither a thing nor a person, but the becoming um, of one or the other. And this is a kind of suspension that radically undermines the telling of linear history. Because without an object or a subject, how can you narrate a stable history? Taking this work as our model, the history of modern painting might be recounted as a spirited investigation into how marks or gestures occupy the space between subjects and objects in order to stage a form of pure passage, becoming what I will call subject objects. Now here I'm making up a word um, or putting two words together to suggest that the subject and object are in some kind of um, protean, uh, unformed state together. I want to talk more about how one can theorize this within modern painting. The art historian Richard Schiff makes this point explicitly with regard to Impressionist painting. 
he writes, quote, the impression, which is, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold, as you can probably hear. Um, Schiff writes, the impression is the embryo of both bodies of one's knowledge, subjective knowledge of the self and objective knowledge of the world. It exists prior to the realization of the subject-object distinction. In other words, <coughs> when Monet um, registers a perception, in a way, it is the objective optical sensation that he is indexically marking. So it's objective. But on the other hand, this sensation, the impression, moves through his sensibility as an individual. It's subjective. So what Schiff argues here is that Impressionism, as, a, as one of the many starting points of modernism, potentially, is in fact the site of the subject object, the place where subjective vision and objective um, marking of information is undecidable. An impression is a deposit of paint that simultaneously registers an objective optical sensation and a subjective temperament. Subject and object cannot be extracted from one another. From the Impressionists onward, modern painters explored multiple possibilities for creating subject-object marks, establishing points along a gradient running from ostensibly pure subjective expression, expressionism, one could say, to the elaboration of objective formal systems. In this regard, one could contrast Kandinsky as a painter of internally, um, sorry, as a painter of passionate impulse, a subjective painter, with Mondrian, the inventor of an internally consistent non-objective um, lexicon as an objective painter. But in fact, as I'm sure most of you are aware, Kandinsky believed in the possibility of creating a lexicon of color, an alphabet of color and form in terms of the um, expanse of shape and the kind of color, and he believed in a kind of language of abstraction. So on the one hand, this was a subjective form, but it was meant to be formalized as an objective system of meaning. Conversely, Mondrian looks like he's doing something scientific with orthogonals and um, and primary colors, but in fact, as is also well known, his compositions were always intuitive. So both of these works, one could say, I would argue that much of modern art is um, hovering around this place of the subject object, where subjectivity and objectivity are converging into one another. So the difference between Kandinsky and Mondrian lies in their relative e emphasis on organic differentiation, as in Kandinsky, versus standardization, as in Mondrian. No matter where an individual artist lies on the spectrum, however, it is clear that every significant modern painter associated with abstraction made an effort to reconcile subject and object through the passage of paint. In other words, what I'm really trying to say here is that this question of how a human becomes and what the difference is between the human and the and the in, unhuman, um, what the meaning of, the, of a being is, is precisely situated in this um, form of passage, this material movement of paint that Twombly said was a form of history. So if passage may function as a bilateral movement, between subject and object, the subject object as I'm calling it, it can also denote um, a passage of time that we might call a now then. So here I'm taking, making a, up another term um, which parallels that of subject object, this undecidability between the human and the, the thing um, as it is marked through the materiality of paint. The now then is the bringing together of distinct moments or temporalities, again, around the very materiality of the paint itself, its very singularity. So here um, I'm showing you the Monet again, 
with a work by Gerhard Richter, um, Uncle Rudy, uh, from 1965, uh, one of his most notorious and best known paintings from the period just after World War II, um, not, pardon me, not just after World War II, in, in the 60s, when he was um, taking uh, photographs from various sources, often personal ones. In this case, his uncle, who's wearing Nazi regalia, and um, rendering these um, images, photographic images, in paint through a kind of blurring, which the art historian Jay Curley has argued in his 2013 book, A Conspiracy of Images, um, was a way of um, blending uh, Cold War difference within the blur itself. So what I would argue here is that what the blur does, the passage of paint, the um, presence of the paint itself in the photograph, is to mark our distance from that original photograph, right? There's a way in which the paint itself, its own material duration, introduces the historical um, duration between uh, the period sometime in the 40s of this photograph and the 1965 reiteration by, um, by uh, Richter. So to just sort of draw these rather diverse lines together, um, I want to look again at the Twombly and think about his line, each line is inhabited by its own history. And this history is both the blurring or the becoming of the subject object and the now then. And Twombly himself is able to do this through his allusion to Lita and the Swan, the now then of history painting, but also the emergence of various organs um, and biological parts, and they're falling back into abstraction as a subject object. My assertion here um, then grows out of Twombly's statement that there is a history imminent to painting's form, that as he puts it, each line is inhabited by its own history. This understanding of history is distinct from art history's typical recounting of what happened when and how one artist's work may lead to another's or how historical context lends meaning to artworks. In other words, this is not the time of art history. This is a different kind of time um, that superimposes different temporalities in the painting itself, in the matter, in the mark itself. This perspective regards each painting as a potential model for doing history in which painting, in which painterly passage spaces time and time space. That's the line below. I'll just read it again. Painterly passage can space time and time space. Now, what do I mean by that? By spacing time, I mean different moments are understood not as successive, as in clock time, this moment is after the one a minute ago, but rather that these different moments are spaced into a kind of architecture of time. Painting can create an architecture of time. And what I mean by timing space is that substance, either organic or inorganic, the substance of paint itself, does not resolve into a stable object or subject but is experienced as a durational process of becoming. So space is itself a temporality. So this is quite abstract, I know, but let me give you some examples of how I see various time scales or historical models within um, historical avant-garde painting, and I hope it will be, uh, become a little more precise. So I'm just going to give um, a number of models now, temporal models. First, um, deferral, a consciousness of the future in the present. That's how I would define deferral. When you defer something, you're thinking about the future. You are keeping something for the future um, in reserve. Or 
it's an inadequacy of the present to receive a certain kind of work. It's an untimeliness. So Duchamp's large glass, which he called a delay in glass, took him several years to make. And um, his idea was, in fact, that the work itself was a kind of, um, of delay, of deferral. Um, that what the work, uh, and, and it also um, tells a story not unlike the painting I showed you, of a lack of consummation. But then some, someone as different as um, Hilma of Klimt, the Swedish mystical painter um, who held her work back um, until after her death because she didn't believe that the designs that she was receiving um, from a spiritual um, being were, were uh, prepared for during her own time. So the deferral there is perhaps less theoretical and based on a kind of untimeliness. Then modern art has been engaged frequently with a kind of prolepsis, which I would define as the projection of a future in the present. So it's kind of the opposite of deferral, which is the consciousness of the future um, in the present. This is the projection of the future into the present. And here I'm showing you a work by Malevich, um, who of course believed that quote, art, thanks to suprematism, has come into its own, that it has attained its pure, unapplied form, and it has re recognized the infallibility of non-objective feeling. It is attempting to set up a genuine world order, a new philosophy of life. It recognizes the non-objectivity of the world, and it no longer is concerned with providing illustrations of the history of manners. That Those are Malevich's words. So he his history is the realization of a future in the present. Deferral is um, the uh, reserving of the present for the future. It's kind of the opposite um, uh, temporal um, signature here. Then, and these are just quick examples, sketches really of different time scales. There's the question of instantaneity, a stopping of time, a consciousness of the moment as rupture, so that in a way duration is foreclosed. And here I'm showing you um, a work by the futurist Umberto Baccioni, The City Rises from 1910, which gives a sense of um, a kind of uh, eventful cataclysmic moment. The futurists, of course, were very interested in um, the destruction of uh, history in order to prepare for modernity. And then something as simple, um, Duchamp is working through this lecture Apologies if you are seeing too much of him, but um, here instantaneity is theoretically um, performed in his three standard stoppages where he drops a meter of string onto wood and creates um, different meter st measuring sticks out of these um, uh, serpentine formed uh, strings. So here the idea of stoppage, they're called the three standard stoppages, is a kind of physical um, one that is transposed to measurement. So instantaneity here is a very different meaning, but nonetheless is um, about a punctual event. Then the idea of flow, which I would um, oppose to instantaneity, is a continuity of time that does not have a strong or any sense of telos. So in a way, it's like what I, how I describe passage. It's a form of duration without an end point. And there are many modern artists that we could think of in this regard. Andre Masson, who made works by um, dropping sand on support and glue and um, creating automatic forms. That's one way of doing this. Um, abstractions such as Helen Frankenthaler's using a thin medium and spilling or staining it is another way of thinking about flow or duration without a telos. Another American mid-century artist, Joan Mitchell, who makes um, a passage of duration without um, a telos in a very different way. Um, her marks are jagged and sharp, as opposed to um, the kind of open staining of Frankenthaler, but nonetheless, the idea of a duration um, cut off from any end point is still there, and then, even an artist like 
Kusama with her dot paintings is creating a similar kind of flow or duration. A fifth model would be permutation, which is defined as a set of logical variations on um, a particular set of rules. So here there is also a duration without endpoint, but one that is structured. And here is a looser version, Jasper Johns. And then finally, uh, getting to more contemporary paintings, including a work that I discussed in the, um, in the essay that uh, Victor has so generously translated for um, the journal for Moscow Art Magazine, um, is the work of R.H. Quaitman, who at this point in her career stored paintings that in the gallery that could be um, hung in different ways. So in a way, storage is another kind of deferral, a stockpiling or accumulation for some future moment. And an artist like um, William Pope L, for instance, um, stores, makes paintings that's about storing compost um, and various other kinds of items and other works so that the painting becomes, and there are many examples in each of these categories that we could name, but the painting becomes a kind of um, storehouse for experience that can be accessed later. It's a kind of deferral of the digital age, one could say. So I believe that Pat painting's capacity to offer a model of materialized history in which, as I said above, um, the passage of painting spaces time and time space is more important than the familiar notion of critique. This is because painting in its articulation of subject object and now then can propose and even experimentally realize other forms of history, other modes of making history. The examples I've shown you model four kinds of history. History directed toward um, an unknown futurity, which includes deferral and prolepsis. A history based on events. A history based on duration without events, without um, any telos or endpoint. And a history based on mediation or storage or um, you can think about mediation in terms of uh, digital mediation as well. Typically, the avant-garde has been understood as devoted to progress, to a kind of teleological history in which one era or style succeeds another. And you could think about an evolution of styles where one builds upon the next and improves upon it. In actuality, none of the four models I have just outlined is strictly speaking teleological, except for the first, but they nonetheless suggest a forward motion in time. But there is another kind of timing that, is almost, that has been almost entirely discounted in the history of Western painting, and that is comic timing. Every comedian knows how important but ineffable, ineffable timing is to his or her success. But philosophically, and with regard to our definition of time as a form of subject object now then passage, the comic might be defined as a falling out of time, or perhaps in a more nuanced way, a falling out of sync with time. So whereas the, um, the models that I've shown you so far have consistently uh, sketched a kind of line what comedy does is it creates a sense of um, out of syncness, of falling out of time, of um, reversal. And uh, for instance, the, um, the theorist Mikhail Bakhtin's notion of carnival, one of the most prestigious accounts of the comedic, um, describe, uh, is based on an inversion of time of everyday life. And here, um, I've just, I'm just showing you a Bruegel painting um, that thematizes carnival as one of those moments when the normal progress of events is inverted or opposed, the high become low, etc. Henri Bergson's idea um, is that laughter is provoked by a rigidity or, rep or um, repetition in the fabric of time. In other words, here in the classic um, uh, Roadrunner comic, 
um, cartoon, the joke is that he keeps running because he's mechanically running along and doesn't realize that there's no longer any ground within him. So the comic is this kind of mechanized repetition um, that occurs to the point um, of absurdity. Comic timing can address forms of history that include a falling in and out of time, a blending of past and future that gives a different kind of history. First of all, it's important to recognize that this asynchronous comic model of time has always complemented what we might be called the tragic key of the avant-garde. And here, um, by tragic, I mean that avant-garde history suggests heroic actions um, and the death of the father. Um, one movement succeeds another um, in a kind of heroic progress um, toward uh, ultimate um, enlightenment. I call such an avant-garde model, model of history tragic because it is both heroic and premised on an epic struggle between masters and their sons, as it were, or their progeny, their sons and daughters. But modernism and later postmodernism always had its own comic mode as well. And here, um, what I'm calling comic does not necessarily mean a joke or that something's funny, but rather a kind of contradiction or absurdity, a falling out of time, um, a contradiction in time. So what, you're, what I'm showing you here is the odd um, coexistence of Picasso's Angra-esque or realist um, rendition of the same topic, the Harlequin, the character from the Commedia dell'arte, um, in the same year that he's doing a Harlequin in a cubist mode. So this does not fit with a tragic model of history painting where one movement succeeds another, but rather a comic model of contradiction where two um, contradictory uh, realities, academic realism and cubism, coexist with one another. Now this is um, a situation that's better, more typically related to postmodern art, but I would argue is, is just as clear as the Picasso instance makes, um, makes apparent in modernism as well. But here in another project which thematizes 1917, Sherry Levine copies by hand in drawings two, um, two reproductions, one of a Malevich and one of a Sheila, Egon Sheila, in order to create two levels of this kind of comic contradiction. First, the idea that in 1917, these two very different types of work coexist, which gives the lie to the idea of a kind of heroic evolutionary history. Um, but secondly, the idea that a young woman in 1984 would be taking the works of two great modernist masters um, from the early 20th century. So there are two levels upon which falling out of time is occurring here um, in terms of stylistic pro proliferation and in terms of anachronistic claiming of content. Let me end with a final example of comic alterity in order to suggest how a comic form of modernism relates to a politics of history. I'm showing you here um, two history paintings one a uh, 19th century um, rendition by the artist Emanuel Leutze of Washington crossing the Delaware from 1851, which is one of the most famous American history paintings showing uh, um, uh, um, a scene from a surprise attack of 1776 of Washington crossing the Delaware River. And on the right is a work by an African-American artist, Robert Colescott, um, titled George Washington Carver Crossing the Delaware, page from an American history textbook from 1975, which is in many ways a kind of comic reinterpretation or contradiction of uh, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Um, this work creates 
um, several levels of, fall, of what I've called falling out of time or alterity in time, a kind of difference in time, which I'm suggesting is related to this question of comedy. First of all, there is the alterity in time itself between the original painting um, that Colescott is making reference to, a great American classic, as I said, and his reworking um, of it in 1975. Second, there is alterity in type. Um, I think even outside of the American context, you can recognize that what Colescott himself is doing as an African-American artist is um, using racist stereotypes um, within his painting, um, substituting the kind of classic American heroes with various forms of racist um, stereotypes of African-Americans, including um, the chef, the mammy, um, and other types that may not be as familiar to you uh, here as in an American context. But the point here is that not only is there a difference in time through the appropriation of the subject, but there's a difference in type from the heroic white figure to the stereotypical comedic African-American figure. And then finally, there's an alterity in culture. Um, the title of Colescott's painting, just to remind you, is George Washington Carver Crossing the Delaware. George Washington Carver was um, an African-American agricultural scientist and inventor who was one of the very few African-American icons of the 18th and 20th century. So in a way, he shares a name with George Washington, George Washington Carver, but he is um, a hero in a very different history, an African-American history, as opposed to a white inflected American history, which poses as universal, but in fact is not. So in discussing the model of history that this, paint, um, that this painting uh, proposes, I want to stress that the subtitle of the work is Page from an American History Textbook. In other words, Colescott had on his mind um, the idea of history, and in fact, we could say, is making a history painting. The artist has stated himself, quote, I was talking about the way the US history was taught when I was growing up. There were two blacks mentioned as significant in US history, George Washington Carver, who's in his painting, and Booker T. Washington, just two. By contrast, the menial workers, Stepan Fetchett's, Aunt Jemima's, Boot Blacks, etc., were too well known to us and to everyone. Their influence weighed heavily when we were only allowed two heroes in all of US history. So in other words, th that's the end of the quote. In other words, what he's saying is that this is what African American people had for heroes in American history, as opposed to um, the story that was meant to be, oh, I'm not doing the pointer right, but this. The comedy here, which is dead serious actually, is how the official history of the United States is ghosted by a deeply racist one. What is structurally comic, but not necessarily funny, is how official American history and the history of American racism which are generally kept apart, are here brought together. So here's this model of bringing the untimely together, of time out of history. That's what I'm defining as the temporal signature of comedy. The comedy comes in the kind of inversion that Bakhtin had theorized as the carnivalesque inversion. One could say that this is a carnivalesque inversion of American history through its um, dark racist imaginary. What I believe is political here is what might be called the intimacy of these two histories, of heroism and racism, that is established in the painting. By intimacy, I mean that these histories touch one another closely. There is no causal relationship, as in tragedy, but a deep sense of shame and embarrassment of contact, of, um, of contradictory contact between a heroic national narrative and a racist um, story that is often left untold.
Contemporary art is often praised for its capacity to subvert conventional narratives and histories. To subvert means to overthrow. It is, of course, possible to claim that Colescott overthrows racism in this painting, but I would argue that such a proposition is wishful thinking, that it is meant to make us feel happy and optimistic about art's political potential, to say that he is subverting racism when we know that it still exists. What his painting does do, however, is quite different. If to subvert is to overthrow, to push something away, intimacy brings it closer. Intimacy is not causal. Its vehicle is not events, but empathy. When a white American like myself looks at the painting like this, he must see all of the intimate marks of racism with which he was raised. In other words, this painting brings an intimate recognition of racist tropes that every American knows um, really have no choice. But the fact that Colescott claims these racist stereotypes as an African American also means that he is intimate with them as well. <coughs> It is this shared history, but from very distinctive subjective positions, not its subversion, but its intimacy that corresponds to the com comedic mode of history painting I wish to explore. Colescott's painting produces discomfort rather than catharsis. It is this discomfort born of intimacy that I believe can be effective as a provocation to act and a way to think the politics of painting in the present. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you.